Hi guys, it's your science teacher here with another video. This time it is all on that awesome property that is sound. We are going to go through waves, uh, how we create waves and some really cool properties of them. So without further ado, let's get into today's video. We start off the topic of sound by looking at waves. The reason why we do this is because sound actually travels as a wave and there is two types of waves that you need to know about. The first one is a transverse wave, which you can make and your teacher probably did uh, by using a slinky and just making it vibrate up and down and the wave is traveling this direction, but the particles are vibrating up and down. And this is what's known as a transverse wave. You've probably seen lots of transverse waves in your life. When you go to the beach, you see transverse waves as they are the waves in a sea. Also, when you make a ripple uh, in a pond, um, that is also a transverse wave. However, sound travels by longitudinal waves and longitudinal waves work for a sit from a series of compressions and what are called rarefactions. Areas of high density and then areas of low density. Now, this wave is traveling in exactly the same direction as in the first example. However, instead of the particles vibrating up and down, they now vibrate from side to side. We also need to know um, a couple of key terms about our waves. The first one we're going to look at is amplitude and we can see amplitude on a transverse wave and the amplitude is simply the height of the wave. We also have the wavelength And that is the distance from one point on the wave to a point, the same point on the next wave. Now, I've just done it from peak to peak here. I could have done it from trough to trough. That's the bottom of the wave to the bottom of the wave. That's also wavelength here. Or I could have even picked this point and then this point is a full cycle and all of them are the same length that is known as the wavelength of your wave another term you need to know is frequency and frequency is the number of waves that pass in a certain amount of time and that's measured in a unit called hertz and if we go down to this longitudinal wave, you need to be able to label the compressions, the areas which are really close together. That's quite a nice word to remember a compression because it's it means that they're really close together. And then the other word is a bit more tricky to remember and that's a rare faction. And a rare faction is the spreading out of them waves. An important thing to remember about both of these types of waves, though, is that waves transfer energy, but not matter. Matter just means anything that has a mass. So waves can transfer information. However, they cannot transfer a physical being. Just think about a rubber duck in the bath. When you've got a rubber duck and you create a wave, that rubber duck will bob up and down, but it won't actually move in any direction. So we learned on the last slide that sound waves are an example of a longitudinal wave, but how do they actually travel to our ear? Well, what they do is they cause the air particles to vibrate. And this causes a series of compressions and refactions all the way to your eardrum, which also vibrates and sends an electrical signal to your brain. You might have noticed that 
sound waves actually travel fastest through solids. You will have experienced this maybe if you've had your head on a desk and a friend has hit that desk, it will cause you to quickly get up because the sound is traveling incredibly fast and losing uh, less energy. The reason for that is because the particles in a solid are all touching. This means that they can pass on the vibrations really, really quickly to one another. And remember, the particles in a solid are also in neat rows and columns. They travel second fastest in a liquid where the particles are touching, but they are no longer in neat rows and columns. And you sometimes get a few air gaps between them particles. In fact, in a liquid, uh, sound does travel that fast that people have been known to go deaf when scuba diving around whales because of the fact the whale calls um, have traveled really fast to their ears and whales are very loud as well and it's actually caused them to go deaf and uh, in a gas this is the slowest uh, rate that sound can be transferred. So I said that um, sound waves work by vibrations and this can be proven by using this equipment over here known as a bell jar. And the way that a bell jar works is it sucks out all of the air using a vacuum pump. And this means that there's no air particles inside to vibrate. This means that you will no longer hear the alarm bell when it sounds. Although sound waves do travel as longitudinal waves, we can turn these waves into transverse waves. And the way we do that is using a machine called an oscilloscope. Doing this, it is much easier to see the sound of the wave produced, how loud it is, and its frequency, the pitch of the wave. Let me see, show you some examples of what I mean. If you have a really loud noise that has a really high amplitude, because it is really loud, it has a high amplitude. If the sound is really quiet, like a mouse, But it's not just the loudness of the wave that I can show with a transverse wave. I can also show its pitch, whether the sound is really high or really low. If the sound is really high, then the frequency is also really high. And that means that the waves are really, really close together. An example of something that has really high frequency could be an opera singer, or it could also be a mouse. They have really high frequency. A really low frequency would look like this. In a low frequency wave, you can see that the wavelength is much larger and the waves are more spread out. And this causes really deep low sounds. An example of a really low frequency sound could be a lion calling. And the fact that it's so low means that it also travels really, really far. Some animals can hear frequencies outside the human's hearing range. And an example is the bat. The bat produces really high frequency sounds, which it uses to detect its prey and it bounces off the prey and then it detects it with really sensitive ears that can pick up high frequency sound. Dogs are also the same. Uh, dogs can hear really high frequency. That's why we can use dog whistles in the park that people cannot hear. I said that bats produce a really high frequency sound that they can only hear and they use that to detect their prey. However, humans also use high frequency sound and it is called ultrasound, which is sound outside of the human hearing range. 
We use ultrasound in looking at babies when a woman is pregnant. The way that happens is that um, some gel is applied to a woman's belly and then an ultrasound machine sends high energy sound waves and these high energy sound waves enter and they can pass through uh, the fluid but they bounce off the baby and this is what's detected by the machine and it produces an image. It does this because it knows how fast the sound will travel through the liquid and if it hits something it will get back faster than it should and then it produces the image on the screen which you've probably seen before you've probably seen an ultrasound of a baby and it always looks a bit similar to this we also use ultrasound imaging when we are calculating the depth of an ocean or a fisherman is looking for fish or even sonar in a submarine that is out battling, looking for other submarines. But this is how the sonar works in a uh, fishing ship or calculating the depth of the ocean. What it does is it sends down a high energy sound wave. It hits the bottom of the ocean and it bounces up. Because we know the speed of sound through water, we can calculate the depth of the ocean because of the fact when it detects it we can use the equation speed equals distance divided by time we know the speed of sound we know the time that it's taken to come back therefore we can calculate the distance in order to calculate the distance all you would do is you would do the speed of sound through the water times by the time it took to receive the signal. Now, if you think about it also, it's going there and it's also coming back. So to get the distance, you'd have to divide everything by two because of the fact that it's traveling that distance twice the sound is. So for example, if uh, you sent out a sonar to calculate the depth of the ocean and it takes 3.5 seconds uh, for that sound to come back to the ship and the speed of sound and water is around 1300 meters per second you could calculate the depth of the ocean by doing 1300 times by 3.5 seconds divided by 2 and that equals 2,307.5 and distance is always measured in meters. You can try that out on your calculator, have a go, have a play with the fraction sign on the calculator um, and see if you get the same answer as me. We're just going to finish off the video by looking at a few other properties of waves. One property of waves is the fact that they can interfere with one another. An example is in noise cancelling headphones. What happens in this property called interference is that the waves either add up or take away from one another. And in noise cancelling headphones, if you've got a sound wave coming in looking like this, what the noise cancelling headphone will do is it will produce a wave in the opposite direction and this causes the waves to cancel one another out. When this wave goes up, this one goes down and so on and so forth. And this will result in a flat line and you will actually have no sound produced, which is why noise cancelling headphones are absolutely great. Another property of sound waves is they can reflect off some objects. For example, if you are walking through a tunnel, uh, you will probably notice if you shout, then your sound will echo. This is because of the fact it is bouncing off the walls that it is hitting. And this is obviously called an echo. 
You can also use echoes to calculate the speed of the waves using uh, the equation on the last slide, but the speed in a gas of waves is always less than through water or a solid. In fact, the speed of sound in air is considerably less at 330 meters per second. And the speed of sound in air is significantly less than the speed of light. This is because um, light is a transverse electromagnetic wave. This is why we can see lightning before we hear the thunder. And that's why that clap law, where you uh, count the claps between each thunder, that works for cal calculating the distance away that it has come from. I really hope you have enjoyed today's video. Remember, if you did, please drop it a like and subscribe to the channel.